Thank you. We're in Genesis chapter 22 tonight. Genesis chapter 22. As we travel through the seven laws of spiritual growth. There, I did it again. Not the seven laws, but as we travel through seven laws of spiritual growth. This is by no means a complete list, but some things we've been looking at. Uh, spiritual principles that apply to all Christians. These principles meet you right where you are. They help you move to where you need to be. That's the point of spiritual growth. We, wanna, uh, we want these principles to come to where we are currently and take us to where we need to be. And uh, none of us, by the way, are where we need to be. Amen? All of us have more growing to do. None of us have arrived. And so uh, these are important things we need to realize. Uh, I've got a little ring back going here, guys. If you help me out a little bit, I'm scaring myself. So, All right, the first law that we talked about states a fundamental reality. God is God, and you are not. God is God, and I am not. That's the first law of spiritual, uh, spiritual growth that we talked about. And uh, again, now that seems kind of overly simplified maybe, but as we talked about that evening, uh, that was a couple weeks ago, uh, every single time we sin, every time we make a choice that goes against God, it is in violation of that principle. We are in a small way are saying, I am God, and he is not. But the truth is, he is God, and we are not. Get this down in your life, and then everything else in life will begin to fall into place. Skip this, and nothing will work. If you, if you don't understand the fact that he is God and we are not, uh, nothing else will work right in your life. Now, as long as you fight with God, your life will be filled with frustration, and uh, you, you're finally going to get to the point where you have to say, or be willing to say, the battle is over, Lord. I'm putting my weapons down, and you win, because fighting God never, ever ends up in a winning situation. And so the first law leads us to a submissive heart. God's will be done. Not, your, not my will but your will be done. Even Jesus recognized that in the garden. Not my will be done, but yours. He is God, we are not. The second law take, took us a step further. God does not need us, but we desperately need him. That is the second law uh, that we talked about in spiritual growth. God does not need us, but we desperately need him. This illuminates our weaknesses, our sinfulness, and our total separation from God because of our sin. God can get along just fine without us, but we cannot live a second without him. He had created us, and he is separate from our universe that he created. He is in and of, complete in himself. And so God can get along fine uh, without us. He can get along fine. He doesn't need our money to operate. Amen? He doesn't need me. Now, I'm thankful that he uses me, and I'm thankful that he'll use you and everybody who gives themselves to him. But he will get his work done uh, without, or with or without us. The blessing is for us. That leads us to our third law of the spiritual life tonight that I want to talk about. And it's simply this. What God demands, God supplies. What God demands, God supplies. This is a word of hope for anyone that finds himself with nowhere else to turn. The third law really brings us right into the heart of the gospel. And so we're going to look at that tonight. Uh, we're going to start with an Old Testament illustration, and we find that in Genesis chapter 22. Let's start reading verse number 1. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, <coughs> excuse me, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I tell thee of, will tell thee of. And Abraham arose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him. If there's one morning in your life, you wouldn't get up early. I think this is one of them, wouldn't it be? But he says he woke up early. He took Isaac, his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went to the place of which God had told him. And on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abram took the wood, the burnt offering, and laid upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac <coughs> spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, 
and said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they both, uh, they went both of them together. And they came to a place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here am I. He said, Lay not thine hand upon thy lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. <laughs> and Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh. As it is said to this day in the mouth of the Lord, it shall be seen. The word Jehovah-Jireh basically is the God the provider. God provides. <coughs> what God demands, God provides. Father, I pray you'd help us in the next few minutes here together. Not only to be reminded what you've already provided, but what you will as we continue to live our Christian life. In Jesus' name, amen. So God comes to Abraham one day and tells him to do the absolute unthinkable. He, to, to take his son Isaac to the region of Moriah and to offer him there as a sacrifice, a burnt offering to the Lord. Now let's just get real raw here. That means to plunge his knife into the chest of his son, kill him, bleed him out, and then build a fire under him and burn his body to the Lord. That's what God was asking him to do. Now, verse 2 stresses the close bond that God knew existed between Abraham and Isaac. Take now thy son, thine only son, that son whom thou lovest. He, really, three different levels of relationship there. And get him there and offer him a burnt offering. This raises many questions, the chief of which, why? Would God ask a father to sacrifice his own son? Is that not in violation of God's very nature? Well, we learned this morning it absolutely is. We're not to give uh, human sacrifices to the Lord. If there was any argument from Abraham, it is not recorded. And I have to think that, I'm not saying for sure there is or isn't, but uh, there's many other times in the Bible where people argued with God. Moses did, uh, Balaam did, and many others who argued with God, and it's recorded for us in Scripture. There is not anything recorded about Abraham, though. He just, uh, God told him to do it, and he rose up early in the morning to get started. He took his son and his servants, and he set out to obey God's command. When they got to Moriah, we see there in verse 5, he told his servants, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. You have to wonder, what was Abraham thinking during this time? What kind of a long three days that must have been? as they're walking along, him not believing of really himself where he's going and what he's going to do. Now, Hebrews 11:19 tells us that Abraham thought his thinking or mindset at this time was that God would raise his son from the dead. <clears throat> when he tells them, the servants, that you stay here with the ass and I'm going to come, my son and I will go up and come again, the, the wording and the language there seems to lead them to believe that we're going to go and we're coming back. That's the way it kind of is laid out there. Somehow Abraham found faith to believe that the God who took his son was the God who could give him back. That's a lot of faith Abraham had. So as they walked along, father and son, Isaac asked the question that must have broke Abraham's heart. He said, Father, behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? What do you answer to that? It's you, boy. <laughs> I mean, that's the answer to the question. I like how Abraham kind of threw it back on God, though. He says, My son... God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Hear that, God? It's on you. Uh, I, I, he'll, he'll have to provide the lamb. Now, across the centuries, those words have echoed out many times in connection to salvation. There is Abraham representing God, placing the wood, representing the cross, upon Isaac, representing Jesus Christ, and just as God the Father offered Jesus, for, or as Abraham did, was ready to offer his son, so God the Father offered Jesus for the sins of the whole world. It is also instructive to see that the son representing Jesus Christ did not seem to put up a fight. Isaac allowed himself to be bound. 
I mean, he's a full-grown man here. He probably could have wrestled it out with Pops and probably won the wrestling match, but he didn't. He submitted himself to be bound and put on that altar. Much like this morning we talked about with... Uh, um, it would be nice if I could remember who I preached on this morning, wouldn't it? Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> when his daughter said, uh, that his daughter said to, to, to do your vow, do what you said to God. It's interesting to see how these children were actually willing to sacrifice themselves. And so it is the father offering his son freely and without complaint, the way that God the Father offered Jesus. Somehow, Abraham understood something about the doctrine of substitutionary atonement. When he said those words, he was pointing not simply to an altar on Mount Moriah. He was uh, talking of a greater sacrifice offered at the very same location, by the way, about 2,000 years after that, when God provided the ultimate lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, for the sins of the world. So they get there, they arrive, Abraham builds an altar of stones, and Isaac presumably is helping him to get this altar built. They place the wood on top of it. I'd love to be there for this scene. All right, we're ready, Dad. Where's the sacrifice? Turn around. He starts to bind him up, tie him up. Boy, I'd like to see what was being said at that scene. Was they, were they both crying? How fast was Abraham's heart beating as he's doing this? What was Isaac's reaction? Uh, I doubt much was said. I mean, what do you say at a moment like this? Uh, what does a son who loves and trusts his father say as he's being bound and put on that altar. Then came the moment of truth. I mean, were their eyes locked in as he lifted the knife up and raised it above the, his own son's chest? I mean, were they looking at each other? Uh, I, I just like to visualize these things sometimes. But just as he is about to plunge, and, I, and he was, I believe, with all my heart, he was going to go through with it. He was going to obey God. As he's about to plunge his knife into his son's chest, uh, that, that very moment, not one second sooner, not one second too late, God spoke to Abraham, lay not thy hand upon the lad. Whew. That had to be the biggest relief since the creation of mankind, <laughs> I think, that moment when Abraham said, Whew, that's good, good to know. The timing is crucial here, but it's also crucial because just as he looks up, he sees a ram caught in a thicket. Uh, and I'm sure he ran to get to that ram before it could free itself. <laughs> We're not going to have this happen again. So he runs over, gets the ram, brings it back. <clears throat> With the same knife that would have been used to take his son's life, he offered that ram on the altar to the Lord. And then he called that place Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. We can sum this whole story up in three short phrases. God saw, God demanded, God provided. Because what God demands, God provides. If God de demands for you to ride, he will provide the horse. If God demands for you to do anything, he gives you the uh, provision. He enables you to be able to do those things that he asks you to do. He demanded a sacrifice, and then he provided what he demanded. As we read this story, it's easy to focus on Abraham's amazing faith, but the real hero of the story is not Abraham. The real hero is God. As great as Abraham was, God was even greater. He gave Abraham a seemingly impossible demand and then provided what Abraham lacked to fulfill the demand he put on him in the first place. Isn't that amazing? God does that with all of us when he demands, uh, whether it's service or a commitment of some type, and we are unable to do it, and then he will come through and uh, give us the provision to do so. He supplied with Abra what Abraham needed to fulfill his demand, thereby doing only what God can do. What God wanted all along, by the way, was not the death of Abraham's son. We know that. He wanted Abraham's absolute obedience. He never meant for Isaac to die, uh, but, he, but it had to happen this way for Abraham to demonstrate his faith and for God to demonstrate his grace. Now, this all happened early in the Old Testament. Several hundred years passed. And one day, God gave the law to Moses on Mount Sinai that would be the guide to the people of Israel. God gave Moses a lot of instructions about the sacrifices they were to give to God uh, for, for, as a picture of what Christ would sacrifice later, but for their sin. Uh, the the uh, animals would have to be unblemished. The law was very specific. There would be no broken bones, no sores, no disease. They had to be without spot and without blemish. Now, it has been noted 
by many people, in fact, many detractors of the Bible, that the Old Testament is a very bloody, bloody by, uh, book, really. The Old Testament, and it is. Uh, if, if you were a priest, you killed animals. That's what you did. You drained their blood, sometimes splashing blood on the altar, burning those animals on the altar all day long. That would be your job, day after day, week after week, month after month. You'd go home with the smell of blood and burning flesh on your clothes. Blood, death, and sacrifice really was much of what the Old Testament was about. There was no end to the killing, no end to the bloodshed, the death. That's the religion that God gave his people. Now, the question then is, did God enjoy the killing of animals? I mean, is this something that brought him pleasure? I don't think so. You think God enjoyed the smell of burning animal flesh? Micah 6, verses 6 and 7, posed the question this way. Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with the calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? And these are rhetorical questions. That's not what God is ultimately interested in. It's even plainer in the New Testament, Hebrews 10, 8. Above when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin, thou wouldest not, neither hadst any pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Now, whatever you can say about the sacrificial system, it was not God's ultimate desire. Uh, all of it from the beginning, he always planned something better uh, than that. And we know, of course, now looking back, uh, Hebrews 10.1 talks about <coughs> all this being a shadow of good things to come. Uh, it's a divine object lesson, teaching them the sacrifice of something, ultimately someone, would be offered on their behalf. So all this was an Old Testament illustration. God is going to demand something for our sins. He's going to demand a perfect sacrifice. Now, none of us are perfect. So therefore, we cannot give ourselves as a perfect sacrifice. We cannot pay for our sins because there is none righteous, no, not one. But yet, that's what God demanded, a perfect sacrifice. We cannot give it to him. And so what does God do? God provides what God demands. What God demands, he always provides. And Abraham, this Old Testament illustration was a perfect uh, illustration of that. We see this New Testament fulfillment then. In a sense, the entire legal system prepared the Jews for the day that John the Baptist saw Jesus. And he said these words, <coughs> Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. John 1.29. What an amazing statement that was. Because he was the Lamb of heaven sent to earth. If we offer a sacrifice, all we can offer is animal blood. But when God offers a lamb, that lamb is his only son. He is the perfect sacrifice. All those animals in the Old Testament put to death were meant to point directly to the perfect sacrifice fulfilled in heaven. But it is an amazing thing to me that when it comes to salvation, God demands something we absolutely cannot deliver. And so he provides it. Because what God demands, God provides. There's an eternal truth in this, a principle. That there's something in God that causes him to provide what we need to meet his righteous demands. Now, that something is his grace. Grace is unmerited favor. That's what it means. Now, we've often used the acrostic, God's riches at Christ's expense. That's what grace is. God's generosity moves him to give us what we do not deserve and what we could never earn. So here's the gospel, and, and the whole gospel in three very distinct statements. God said, do this. We said, we can't, and he said, I will. That's the gospel right there. We Do this, we can't, I will. God demanded perfection. We couldn't meet the standard. So God sent his son who was perfect in our place. God demanded a payment for sin. We couldn't make the payment. So God sent his son to pay the full price on our behalf. God demanded righteousness. But all we could offer was filthy rags. And so God had sent his son who took our sin so that we could be clothed in his righteousness. God demanded a bloody sacrifice for sin. We couldn't meet that demand. So God had sent his son to die in our place, shedding his blood, paying the price. Because what God demands, God supplies. Isn't that a blessing? All throughout our life. If God didn't supply his demand, we would be completely helpless. His holiness demanded a perfect sacrifice. 
His love sent us His Son. God says, you must. We said, we can't. He said, I will. And that's the whole gospel and really our Christian life in a nutshell. What He demanded from us, He gave to us. What we needed, He provided. And there's more than just salvation. He knew that we needed guidance, so He gave us His Word, the Bible. And this is the perfect guidance right here. We don't listen to angels. We don't have visions. We don't uh, hear voices in the night. If we do, we probably had too much pizza the night before. Uh, what he leads us with is this book right here. He leads us with his word. And I still have people many times who try to talk to me about different visions they've had or such things. Uh, this right here is what we, this is our guide. This is our guide for our life, our actions, our beliefs, and all that. He gives us his word. He knew, he knew we needed power. We needed power to serve him. We can't serve him in our own power, so what does he do? He gives us the Holy Spirit because what God demands, God supplies. And when he tells us to do things like the Great Commission, he knows we don't have the power, the ability to do that. He gives us the Holy Spirit. He knew we needed encouragement. We are creatures that crave encouragement. I mean, we can't go very long at all without some encouragement in our lives. <clears throat> so what does God do? He gives us a local church with brothers and sisters in Christ who put their arms around one another, encourage each other to serve the Lord. And so God, what he demands, he supplies. And he placed us in Christ. All those great words of the gospel, salvation, forgiveness, grace, mercy, love, peace, hope, eternal life, redemption, substitution, propitiation, reconciliation, adoption, justification, regeneration, glorification, all of that is given to us freely in Christ. It is all in response to a demand that he gave that we could not fulfill and so he gave. What God demands, God supplies. That is an amazing truth for our Christian life. All of it is ours. All of it is free. All of it comes to us as a gift from God through Jesus Christ. We don't deserve any of it. <clears throat> we could never have earned it in a million years. Micah chapter 7 verse 18. Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He retaineth not his anger forever, because he delighteth in mercy. I wish I delighted in mercy more. I'd be a better man for it. But, and I'm trying, but the Lord delights in mercy. What a blessing that is. He's a God who delights to show mercy to sinners like you and me. He loves to forgive sin. He sends his son to die so that he could say to a whole world out there, whosoever will may come. What a blessing that is. There's no other religion in the world like Christianity. We're the only uh, people in the world who preach the grace of God without works. Every other, Christ, every other religion says, do this, do that. Uh, our God says it's already been done for you. As I mentioned this morning, only two religions in the whole world, do, doing and done. Those are the two religions uh, we believe in, the one that has been finished on the cross. With all that effort of what religions demand, and what do they demand? Give money, go, give it to a church, a synagogue, or a mosque, pray toward Mecca, light a candle, keep the feast days, give alms to the poor, follow the Ten Commandments, be baptized, follow the golden rule, try harder, do your best, follow the program, live a good life, and with all that effort, how do we know we won't blow it by tomorrow <laughs> with some stupid sin in our life? Years ago, I don't know if you remember uh, Attorney General John Ashcroft, he explained the difference between Islam and Christianity. He later sort of retracted this, but I think he was spot on. He said, in radical Islam, God tells you to send your son to die for him. In Christianity, God sends his son to die for you. That's really the difference right there in all religions and in Christianity. Which, By the way, which God do you want to serve? I know which one I want to serve, amen? God of grace. Now let me share uh, two different uh, simple applications here. <clears throat> if God provided all that we need, then all we must do is reach out and receive what he offers. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, Come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. The psalmist encourages us to taste and see that the Lord is good in Psalm 34, 8. How simple it is to be saved. And what a blessing it is that he offered that to us. Then secondly, if you've experienced God's grace, we ought to respond with a profound gratitude. Paul talked about the uh, love of Christ constraineth me, he said. 
That's what keeps him going. We don't serve out of a feeling of duty. We serve out of a feeling of gratitude to the Lord for what he's done. Now, I'm not against duty. I think all of us have a duty to serve the Lord. What I mean is we're not serving as a way to earn God's favor. We have to do it to earn his, uh, to merit his grace. He simply gives it. He found us, saved us, redeemed us, gave us new life, and set us on the road to heaven. And that gives us something we ought to give thanks to God every day of our life. And it doesn't stop there. As we're living the Christian life, God makes some demands. Did you know, by the way, there's an expectation in how we live our life? I mean, we know that. It doesn't just stop at salvation. He demands a holy life. And so he demands us to read and study and apply God's word in our life. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. We're not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. We're to be in this book. It's a command. We're to read the Bible. We're to be uh, constantly trying to get to know God better, like Paul said, that I may know him. And uh, that ought to be our desire, too. We're commanded, and he demands us to live a holy life. He desires our sanctification. Be set apart. Uh, set apart to serve. First Thessalonians 4, 3, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. Luke 1, 75 tells us to live in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. We're to live a holy life. He demands these things. He, he demands also for us to all be somehow involved in soul winning and giving the gospel. Uh, God is not willing that any should perish. Uh, Mark 16, 15, and he said unto them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Every one of us who's a child of God has part of that responsibility on our shoulders. Christ's last command ought to be our first priority. And so every one of us, whether it be the gospel tracts and giving to missions and talking to people and, and uh, starting conversations or using our social media or however we do it, we need to be about uh, telling others about Christ. It's not a gift, by the way. This is not a spiritual gift. It is a heavenly command. I know I've had people say before, well, witnessing's just not my gift. Um, it's not mine either, by the way. Pastor Forsberg's the only one that has that gift, okay? We all have to work at it. It comes natural to him. But uh, no, I'm just kidding. It doesn't, honestly. It's something that he's took on himself because he knows it's a command and a responsibility. Number four, he demands a right heart attitude. Our service for Christ is to be right from the heart with pure motives. Ephesians 6, 7, and 8, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether it be bond or free. We're supposed to properly use our time. These are commands in Scripture. He demands for us to redeem the time, buy the time back, quick wasting time, he says. Make good use of the small amount of time God gives us. He tells us in Ephesians 5, 15, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time uh, because the days are evil. He demands civil obedience. Uh, we're to submit to every ordinance of man, to maintain a good testimony in front of people, to try to win them. First, Timothy, uh, First Peter, I'm sorry, 2.13, submit yourself to every ordinance of man uh, for the Lord's sake, whether it be the king as supreme. Verse 15, for so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. That's talking about having the right kind of testimony. God demands us, here's a hard one, God demands us to be joyful. We're supposed to wake up happy. Amen? Early in the morning, is that what happens to you when you get up, bounce up out of bed with a big old smile on your face? After coffee, amen? Thank God he gives us coffee. That's a blessing. Uh, but he says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, rejoice evermore. He also commands us to pray. Pray without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Uh, we are, that's a command. It's, not a, it's, it's a demand of the Lord. And then he tells us, ah, this is getting more and more convicting. We're to give thanks in everything. Not for everything, but in everything. We're to give thanks. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. You see, how in the world do we do all this? I mean, it's a long list of things. And by the way, that's not a complete list. We could pick out many more. We're to forgive. We're to give. We're to treat people with kindness. We're to ugh, hate our, our, sorry, we're to love our enemies. <laughs> that was a slip of, a Freudian slip, they call that, I think. We're supposed to love our enemies. I find it interesting. The Bible tells us to love our neighbors, and it tells us to love our enemies, because a lot of times we're the same people. Uh, but uh, we're to love those that despitefully use us. A lot of commands in Scripture are pretty tough, and God demands those things. And so 
how do we do it? How, how do we see that God, when he demands that, he also supplies? I think the answer is found if we look at a person. And I'd like to introduce you to this person. His name is Peter, found in John chapter 18. You don't have to turn there. I just want to tell you about what happened there. You know the story. <clears throat> After he has just passionately told Jesus, he'll follow him to the ends of the earth. I don't care what happens, what, what the bad happens. I will be with you to the death. Not only that, he insulted all the comrades with him. He said, all these jokers might fail you, but I will go with you to the end. And now in John 18, he does exactly what Jesus told him he'd do. He fails him three times. Three times. In front of a girl, nonetheless. Just a, a, just, just a maiden. He couldn't even stand up for Christ to her. Wasn't a bunch of armed soldiers. Just a, just a maiden. Couldn't even stand for her. Uh, up to her. The Bible says in John 18, he went out and wept bitterly. Now may I introduce you to the same man at a different time. Acts chapter 4. He stood in front of the high priest. He tells the high priest, let me tell you who Jesus is. To the high priest. Jesus is the one, the Messiah of Israel, who you crucified. That's what he's talking to the priest, the guys who could have him jailed, and actually did have him jailed because of that. He, he, there's, here's Christ whom you crucified. So they threaten him. They threaten him with imprisonment and death. You know what he says? We cannot but speak of the things which we have seen and heard. Peter, Peter, who just couldn't stand up to this girl, is saying, look, I, you threaten me with death all you want to. I can't stop talking about my Savior to either. I'm going to keep on talking about him. In Acts chapter 5, it's Peter who confronts Ananias and Sapphira, and they fall dead at his feet. Now, we look, we look at those two different sections in Peter's life. What in the world happened to this spineless loudmouth? Well, what happened to this spineless loudmouth happened in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Here's what it says. But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses to me, both in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. You see, what God demands, God supplies. And so when he demands a holy life from us, when he demands that we be a witness, when he demands that we love our enemies, when he demands we forgive those that are really, really hard to forgive, when he demands that we do all those things that seeming, are, are seemingly humanly impossible, he then gifts us with the Holy Spirit to empower us to do all that. Because what God demands, God supplies. Isn't that a wonderful spiritual truth about the Lord? He doesn't ask you for anything that you can't do. He doesn't ask you to do something that's beyond the powers of you achieving because what he demands he supplies sometimes it seems like it i don't know how many times i've heard testimonies of of uh, great preachers and they'll give their testimony when i was a kid i stuttered so bad i couldn't even say a straight sentence and god called him to preach and i think what in the world are you calling me for i can't, I can't even speak straight but god empowered him god uh, healed him of that or, or uh, they got beyond it because what god demands god supplies what a great truth the same is true in your life as well. He will not ask you to do anything that he will not empower you to do. He will not ask you uh, to sacrifice anything that he won't provide for you to sacrifice. Uh, after, and sometimes even after we sacrifice it. Like Abraham, sacrificing his own son, God stops him and then he says, Here, your sacrifice is over there caught in a bush. Because what God demands, God supplies. Isn't that a blessing? So, serve then with confidence. Serve with the knowledge that when God tells you to do something that's seemingly impossible, it, it, just a practical example of that, we talked about it tonight in discipleship, tithing. I've talked to people, pastor, there's no way I could tithe. Yet God commands us to do it. And what God demands, God supplies. I tr I'm telling you, it works. Those type of things work. If you honor God by doing what he tells you to do, he will supply it. Try him out. In fact, Malachi, in that specific department, he says, prove it. See if I don't open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. Because what he, what he demands, he supplies. Praise the Lord for that.